We're ultimately here to make sure that when money comes off people's paychecks and 30 years later, 35 years later, that they receive the pension. You know, I describe internally that the portfolio needs to be a super tanker. It just needs to push through things. Markets cycle, markets will go up and down, and just stay invested. John Graham is a scientist and inventor. He holds more than 30 U.S. patents. My PhD was actually in surface science, was actually trying to understand the interaction of materials when they come together. But more than a decade into his career, one phone call from a headhunter changed everything. I tell this story internally and, and got a call from a, a recruiter. And I always, you know, maybe John Graham's a very common name, who knows? If it was the right John Graham. It was the right John Graham. And today, Graham is president and CEO of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, the third party asset manager responsible for stewarding the compulsory National Canada Pension Plan. CPPIB was created in 1997 by the Canadian Parliament in response to demographic shifts in the population that threatened the viability of the pension plan. Contributions from working Canadians were no longer enough. Canada needed dedicated professionals to invest and grow the funds. The very first check we received was for $12 million. Today, the CPPIB manages more than 630 billion Canadian dollars. That's roughly half a trillion US dollars. But of the 632 billion, almost two thirds of that is investment income. Almost two thirds of that is money that has been generated by exposing the capital to the capital markets. Over the past 10 years, the fund has earned an annualized net return of 9.2%. As for Graham, he remains grateful he answered that recruiting call all those years ago. I took on this role at the beginning of 2021. And for me, this is my destination role. So for those people that don't live in Canada, which is a lot of people, uh, what actually is the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board? Sure. It'd probably be helpful if I explained what the Canada Pension Plan is also. And the Canada Pension Plan is the compulsory national pension plan that all working Canadians contribute to. So working Canadians, every paycheck, a certain amount of money comes off the paycheck. Um, employers also contribute to it. And it's the national program that when people retire, they'll get um, a defined benefit plan. CPP Investments is the third party asset manager for the Canada Pension Plan. <clears throat> so we manage the surplus funds that aren't needed at that time to pay out benefits. What is the size of the Canadian Pension Plan right now? Yeah, so right now, as of March 31st, we're managed 632 billion of assets. 632 billion Canadian dollars. Canadian dollars of assets. Okay. And in American dollars, that's about what? Half a trillion. And therefore, that's a half a trillion dollars that's sitting there. Somebody's investing it to get a good rate of return. We don't have that in the United States. We don't have a pot of money sitting around. People are investing. We just have a so-called pay-as-you-go system. Yeah, and in fact, there was um, originally that's how the Canada Pension Plan was set up. Uh, it was set up in the 1960s as a pay-as-you-go. And the demographics worked really well. And when you have a lot of people working and fewer retirees, the, you know, the pay-as-you-go pay plan works really well. Actually, we were created in the 1990s. We were created when they realized that sometime in the mid-2010s, there was going to be a pension crisis. Demographics were going the wrong way. You had a chronically underfunded pension system. So the provinces and the federal government in Canada came together, and they restructured the Canada Pension Plan. They uh, looked at the contribution rates. They looked at the benefits. But they also created Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, CPPIB a third party, arm's length asset manager that would manage the surplus funds. So in the United States system, the so-called pay-as-you-go system, when money comes in and it's not expended right away, though it usually is, it's put in treasury bills, short-term treasury bills, which in today's environment might yield four or five percent. But your goal is to get more than you would get in a treasury bill. So what is your overall goal at the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board? Is it to get 10 percent rates of return, 8 percent, 9 percent? What kind of goal do you have? There's a minimum uh, real rate of return that will sustain the plan. Um, it'd be just under 4% real. But our goal is to actually achieve much higher than that 
Uh, we've been successful at that. Our returns over the past 10 years have been 9.2% for the, for the portfolio. And we do that by basically building a diversified portfolio across geographies, across asset classes, including private equity, infrastructure, real estate, credit. I should disclose that my firm has gotten some money over the years from Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board, but we've also gotten money from the provincial uh, pension plan. So Correct. let's suppose Ontario has its own uh, retirement system. Uh, Saskatchewan has one. Uh, British Columbia has one. So let's suppose I live in British Columbia mm. um, and I put money into the Canadian pension plan when I'm working and then I also live in British Columbia. Can I collect the British Columbia pension plan uh, retirement money and also the CPP IB money? Really you can think of it as this joint uh, provincial federal plan. And what's important there is that all of the provinces except Quebec who have their own plan participate in CPP so it's portable. You can also move across the country. You can work in Alberta, retire in Newfoundland, and there's no concern about how you're going to collect your pension. If you work in a given province and you have a, you know, you're a civil servant in that province, you probably have a provincial plan and you collect both. What is the retirement age, is there one in Canada? The United States has largely eliminated retirement ages, more or less. Uh, is there a certain age that you can retire and collect your money from the CPPIB? Well, from CPP. CPP. Um, yes. Yeah, so, you manage it, but the CPP. Yeah, So, because we do not administer the plan. And people have a choice on when they retire, and people have it, or collect from the CPP as early as 60 and as late as 70. And we would always say you should talk to a financial planner as to when the best time is for you to uh, collect your pension. Okay, so somebody, let's say, at 65 can say, I'm ready to retire. I will get less than if I retired, presumably at 70, maybe. Correct. But if I retire at 65, I get what I'm going to get until I die, more or less. Correct. So I notice you don't have any gray hair. Um, <laughs> so how do you manage $600 plus billion dollars and not get gray hair? How do I not get gray hair? I guess it's yeah. probably good genetics. Well, let's talk about your genetics. Uh, where were you born and who were your parents? Yes, I was born in Ottawa, which is the, the nation's capital. Um, my dad was a research scientist and my mom was a pharmacist. And when you were growing up, did you say, I want to someday run the CPPIB? Growing up, CPPIB didn't exist. Oh, so you couldn't <laughs> have said so that. So I couldn't have said it, yeah. All right, but as I understand it, you went to college in Canada. Correct. And you got a, did you get a PhD ultimately? A PhD, yes, in physical chemistry. What is physical chemistry for those who didn't take Chemistry 101? Yeah, so my PhD was actually in surface science. It was actually trying to understand the interaction of materials when they come together. And so after you graduated, what did you do? I actually went and worked in industrial research in the Xerox Innovation Group. Did you invent anything? Did you get any patents? Yeah, so at the time, so I finished uh, my PhD in the 1990s, and, and Xerox was one of the premier industrial research labs in the world. And I went and um, worked there for almost a decade and worked as a bench scientist for almost a decade and through that time published papers and received numerous uh, U.S. patents. I think probably close to 35, 36 patents. Okay, so do you get any money off those patents now or? No, because they belong to the company. Oh, the company gets them. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you're sitting there minding your business, filing patent applications all the time. And then how did you get a job in the investment world? Because you wouldn't have been a logical candidate, it would seem to me, to be in the investment world. So in kind of the early 2000s, did uh, part-time MBA. So I did have some kind of formal uh, training in it. Uh, and then I tell this story internally and, and got a call from a, a recruiter. And I always, you know, maybe John Graham's a very common name, who knows if it was the right John Graham, but uh, decided to go and talk to these people at CPPIB. So how many years after you joined did you become the CEO? Around 13, 14 years. So many people in the United States and around the world are also obsessed with the U.S. presidential election. The theory is that if one candidate wins versus another candidate, it will mean certain policies will be in favor and other, other ones will not be in favor. Do you worry about the U.S. presidential election and what the impact's going to be on the investment portfolio? So as I think about CPP investments, and we have a very long time horizon. And um, so we, we think about 20 years out. And we think about how do you build a portfolio that can essentially weather all types of um, 
macroeconomic, geopolitical uh, environments. You know, I describe internally that the portfolio needs to be a super tanker. It just needs to push through things. And so with respect to any election around the world, we can't build a portfolio that's dependent on any given election. You just need to be, have a portfolio where we have the expectation to have good relationships and be able to invest in any type of administration in the countries we invest in. Now, there's another concern that many people have about when interest rates are mm -hmm. going to come down in the United States. Do you worry about interest rates going up and you try to time that, or it's just not within your horizon to worry about that timing of that kind of thing? Yeah, we don't time, and, and, and we certainly, you know, I think it's one of the things that we really tried to build the portfolio through long-term asset allocation and then pick good investments to, to fill that allocation. We really don't do a lot of tactical timing with respect to interest rates, currencies and such. It's hard, right? It's really hard to, uh, to time the market. Our private equity model, uh, I would describe it as a partnership model where within our private equity portfolio, we have a very sizable funds portfolio where we're an LP with who we think are the best GPs in the world. Today, uh, when you're looking at investments, you do, don't invest only in Canada, you invest outside of Canada. What percentage of your investments are in Canada? What percentage are outside? Of our last annual report, we had around 12% of the assets in Canada. And it kind of has, has ebbed recently between 12 and 15% of the assets in Canada, and the rest is in, invested abroad. Okay, so the place you invest the most outside of Canada, I presume, is the United States, your neighbor? Correct. So you invest across the board. You don't invest only in fixed income like presumably the U.S. Social Security system does, I guess it does Treasury bills, but doesn't do anything else. You invest in public equities, you invest in private equity, you invest in fixed income, in distressed debt, real estate. Um, is there anything you don't invest in that's a legitimate investment opportunity? So we try to build a portfolio that has exposure from a geography perspective to the big economies around the world. We don't invest in every country. Um, but we try to invest in the, in the bigger, fastest growing economies. And from an asset class, yeah, I mean, we have about, if, you, if we include energy, we have about 30% of the portfolio in private equity, including energy, 30% in public equities, 8% real estate, 8% infrastructure, 13% okay. credit, and the rest in fixed income. What about cryptocurrencies? No, we've not, not done crypto direct. And no. you do startup venture capital, or that's too risky too? No, we do. So within our private equity, um, so within our private equity department, they do venture capital, growth equity, um, and you know, the more traditional leverage buyouts. But we just we try to maintain you know, exposure to the different parts to uh, just to have some visibility or some insight into that market. In Canada, there's what's called a Canadian model, and the Canadian model, as I understand it, is that you sometimes take the lead in doing deals. In other words, you don't just say, "I'll give you money to KKR, Blackstone, or Carlisle." put in a fund and they invest the fund in a deal. You say, I want to be your partner. I will put up as much as the fund might put up, the KKR might put up, or you might take the lead and just say, KKR, we're taking the lead. You can come in as our minority partner. Is that fair that you do a fair bit of that? Is that unusual in the pension world? Our private equity model, uh, I would describe it as a partnership model, where within our private equity portfolio, we have a very sizable funds portfolio where we're an LP with who we think are the best GPs in the world. And then we'll do everything from co-investing to co-underwriting. I wouldn't use the term lead the deal um, because we really actually look to always partner with who we think are the best GPs. In my experience, what happens sometimes is that people will come to an investment committee, they'll give you a 500 page memo telling you <laughs> this is the greatest deal of all time. And then you say, okay, I'll go into this greatest deal of all time. And then a year passes and a year, a second year passes and then it doesn't look like it's going so well. Do you ever say, let's get out of this deal or you wait till the end and you never really short circuit a deal by getting out within one or two or three years, well before when you were supposed to get out? Will we exit early from a transaction? I, I'm a big believer and it's one of the things I've really been trying to do over the last few years of, of pretty active asset management on the portfolio. Um, really asking every portfolio manager at the end of the year um, to really say that this portfolio is better than the one we started with. So every 
year, the, the portfolio managers are asked, like, is this the best portfolio you can have? And if not, should we be actually looking to upgrade it? What do you ever say, we made a mistake, we're getting out of this deal right away, or do you just let the deal guys say, we're going to wait another year or two or three? Or do you actually sometimes say, this was a turkey, we made a mistake, we're getting out? Well, I don't know if I would necessarily say it. You'd like to people to come to the own, their own conclusions. But my background, I spent most of the time in credit. And I think this is probably a little bit more common in the credit world where we'll look at something and say the, the opportunity cost of holding this is too high. Even if you have to not get your realized return on this, I can recycle this capital into something better. So under your model, you use partners to actually team up with, but you sometimes do things yourself. Do you, do you want to do more things with CPBIB doing it completely itself, or do you want to do things with partners more? One of our guiding principles, one of our key kind of beliefs is partnership. And we continue to lean in pretty hard to the, to the partnership model. And we have partners across the world, best in class partners, and we're going to continue to, to lean into the partnership model. Every year when you finish your returns and it's public, what you have done, does that get printed in the papers to get a lot of attention or people say it's not enough, they say it's pretty good? How do you, uh, let, how do you get feedback from the public about how you're doing with their money? So we're a big believer in transparency. Uh, a couple years ago, we, were, we won an award as the most transparent uh, in the world. I think we finished second last year. Uh, and we actually disclose on a quarterly basis and then we obviously have the, the annual. So when we release our results after March 31st, that's our, our year end, um, it does generate quite a bit of interest and quite a bit of interest domestically and we'll get considerable press and we'll certainly get different perspectives on, on what went well and what, uh, what we could have done better. So you don't believe that transparency is overrated, right? No, I think for us, for, for who we are and for the capital that we manage, it's important that we lean into transparency. We lean into transparency around uh, our returns, the assets we hold. We actually disclose all the assets, and we, we, we put it into our quarterly results, all the transactions we do. And we provide a lot of transparency on the cost and the cost to run the organization. So let's talk about um, the political pressure you might feel. So let's suppose somebody's an important legislator in Canada, and he says, uh, my cousin has a really good investment fund and this is the best investment fund, it's in AI, and this is going to be the next NVIDIA if you invest in it. Um, do you ever get any political pressure like that, or are you isolated from that? When they set up the organization, and I think th this is one of the real, I think, secret sauces of the organization when they set it up, is they set it up to be arm's length, and they wanted an independent asset manager that really just focused on you know, maximizing return without undue risk of loss. And now we ultimately will be accountable to the stewards, which will be the finance ministers uh, across the country. But we have, in between that, we have a very professional board of directors. And I will say in the 16 years plus years that I've been there, I've never had a situation like that. Now, I travel all over the world and governments all over the world want you to invest more in their country. And I think people are just doing their job when they ask you to invest more in their country. But I've never had a case, as you described, saying, can you please invest in this? It's just remarkable uh, how FOMO and that fear of missing out can really drive people into things that they may not really understand that well. Now, do you ever go to cocktail parties and you introduce yourself and you say, I'm the head of the CPBIB, and people say to you, what can I do with my money that you ever get asked for that kind of investment advice? Yeah, I occasionally do. And my uh, response is always that you should go hire a certified financial planner. Okay, so you don't give free investment advice. <laughs> I don't give investment advice. So what do you think is the most common mistake the average investor makes? Yeah. Your observation over many years now as an investment professional, uh, what would you say is the most common mistake either average investors make or professional investors make? I think probably the one area that I continue to be um, surprised by, and I'm probably guilty of it, is FOMO. You mentioned crypto, you, you, you mentioned AI. It's just remarkable uh, how FOMO and that fear of missing out can really drive people into things that they may not really understand that well. FOMO, for those who don't know, means fear of missing out. 
Correct. Which is a big fear that people have that somebody else is going to make more money than they are Correct. and they should jump in uh, and they usually jump in when it's too late. They usually jump in when it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. and I, you see it with very sophisticated investors. So what's the best investment advice you ever received from anybody when you got into this business? Yeah, best investment, and I think it's probably very consistent with CPP investments, and that is to really continue to focus on the long term. Markets cycle, markets will go up and down, and just stay invested. Don't try to time the markets, it just gives you the opportunity to wrong, be wrong twice, and just stay invested. So if somebody came to you at a cocktail party, the famous <laughs> cocktail party, and said, look, I really don't know anything about investments, I have an extra $100,000, what should I do with it? What would you tell them to do? Same thing, to go, go, go talk to a certified financial planner. Okay. Now, some certified financial investment <laughs> professionals would say, look, you can't beat the market. Yeah. Put your money in index funds. Yeah. Why doesn't the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board just index everything, and that way you won't be subject to any criticism saying you didn't do a good job. You just reflect the market. Why not just do that? Yeah. And, and this is, I think we're in a period right now with the Magnificent Seven and a few stocks really dominating, dominating the markets that we're big believers in diversification. So I get back to who we are and what we're solving for. And you know, we're not a, a wealth maximization vehicle, we're a pension plan. And we're ultimately here to make sure that that pension promise is met. We're ultimately here to make sure that when money comes off people's paychecks and 30 years later, 35 years later, that they receive the pension, that that liability in the future is met. And it's not easy to do that. You know, many countries around the world won't be able to meet this, this pension promise. Canada has done, a, I think, a remarkable job in putting in place a structure where it's sustainable for at least 75 more years. So to do that, we're big believers that over the long run, you need to have a diversified portfolio need to invest in lots of different geographies around the world and in lots of different asset classes, some that have higher return expectations like private equity and some like fixed income where it'll be a little bit more steady. And over the long run, based on what we're solving for and what we're actually trying to do, that is the low risk way to deliver on our mandate. What would you like people to know about CPBIB? People all over the world are gonna watch this and they're gonna say, Canada has a better model than we have, or Canada doesn't have as good a model as we have. So what would you like people to know about the CPBIB model, and why do you think it's actually a pretty good model? I think, first of all, the performance. That CPP Investments is one of the highest performing institutional investors in the world. As I mentioned, the returns over the past 10 years have been 9.2% on an annual basis, a CAGR, and it's very, very good returns. I think the other thing that is really important about CBP investments is it does, it is a great example of when policymakers can come together and solve a problem and solve a public problem with a private solution and create CPP investments to prevent a problem that's 20, 25 years out. And to date, as I said, it has been successful with two thirds of the capital being from investment income and only a, th and a third from, from contributions. I just think it's, a, it's an amazing example of how things can work. In your case, uh, you're obviously an intelligent, well-informed person, a good investor. Uh, why don't you go into the Canadian government and become a finance minister? Have you ever thought of that? I took on this role at the beginning of 2021. And for me, this is my destination role. And you're gonna retire uh, at 85 or 90 or you? you <laughs> You're going to keep doing this forever, right? I work at the pleasure of the board, and I will do it as long as they let me do it.